first I gotta catch my breath. <laughs> good morning, everybody. It's so good to see so many of y'all here today. Let us stand and sing a song together. Or two, or three, or four. No, just two. Tell it to Jesus. That's not the version we're going to do today. selected this particular scripture is uh, it's not too lengthy <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty important Jesus uh, was talking to Peter Simon Peter so let me read the verses found in John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, he saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Feed the lambs. He saith again to him, the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. 
He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. I find this interesting, and some might disagree. What's the difference in the lamb and the sheep? And my take on this is when Jesus was speaking to Peter, he was saying, Lambs, lambs, lovest thou the lambs? Peter, feed the lambs. Feed the the new, the new converts. Amen. And the second, he was speaking of the sheep. And to me, that's the whole congregation of the church. The sheep. And it beholds me to remind us, the church, as Jesus did to Peter, that we need to be feeding the sheep and the lamb. Bring them in. Tell them that Jesus Amen. loves them. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're grateful that we can love you because of what you did for us at Calvary. Father in heaven, we want to encourage people as I myself need to be encouraging others to come back to your house, to join in the love that you have for them. Father, today we just praise you, Lord, and love you with all our hearts, all our souls, all of our minds. Lord, because you are so good to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Does anybody have announcements? I'm going to do some announcements. Okay. Yeah, so hold on to that thought. The shower. Yeah. Let's sing again. Yeah. We're going to sing about tomorrow. I know who holds tomorrow.
can be seated. Um, Curtis and I are going to try to do a song today. Amen. Y'all say a little prayer for me because I get nervous. Bless your I do. I mean, I shouldn't. I'm up here all the time, and y'all are just friends, but there's something about it. So, y'all help me. <laughs> I'm a little nervous right now. But, um,. You know, I like the words of that last song a lot. It's very encouraging, but I struggle because, like, it's written like, oh, I never worry. <laughs> and, shoo, honey, I worry sometimes and worry more than I should about the future. Um, but um, we've heard this song a while ago, and it really spoke to both of us, and I couldn't find it on um, accompaniment. So Curtis was like, well, I'll learn it. And he did, and we're going to do it together. Um, and it's just a reminder that, you know, we all go through things. You know, sometimes it can feel like literally the world is crumbling around us. But, you know, that's where this verse came from. We will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. We don't have to be afraid of the future. Because um, we know who's already there. And we can rest in his promises that no matter what, it's going to be okay. So y'all just pray for us. My heart is breaking in a way I never thought it could. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. A little sneak peek. <laughs> My heart is breaking in a way I never thought it could. My mind is racing with the question, are you still good? Can you make something from the wreckage? Could you take this heart and make it whole again? Though the mountains may be moved into the sea, though the ground beneath might crumble and give way, I can hear my father singing over me. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. I've blamed myself. And if I'm honest, maybe I've blamed you too. But you would not forsake me, cause only good things come from you. Though the mountains may be moved into the sea, though the ground beneath might crumble and give way, I can hear my father singing over me. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay From beginning to the end You're so close You have never let me down And you won't In the valleys, in the shadow I know You're so close You're so close Though the mountains may be moved into the sea Though the ground beneath might crumble and give way, I can hear my father singing over me. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be good. I like that song. Does anybody know where it, uh, this idea of saying it's going to be okay came from? No. I, I cannot find, I, I need to go home and Google that, I guess. If I had any sense, I'd do that, but uh, to find out why, you know, because somewhere along the way, somebody decided, okay, that means good, yeah. or 
What's that mean? That mean good's gonna turn out okay? Why not? Why not uh, FK or BA? It's gonna be a BA, okay? I see you even do it. Okay, so we just got so uh, used to that now. So, but I don't really know where that comes from, and that's not all. I don't know. Um, I've had the eye surgery this week. This has been an interesting week. Uh, someday I'll tell you all about it, but. Uh, uh, back in January, my eyes went bad after a little old stroke, and uh, I, I had double vision. So when I came out here, I had twice the church that I had, and that was okay. Of course, some of you, I didn't want to see two of you, but... Uh, and then that went away, and, uh, but it messed up my eyes, and everything was blurred, and I had one good eye, and this was the good eye. And this was the bad eye, so everybody over here was blurred. Or let me see. Yeah, yeah. Was right. No, this was this was the bad eye. And uh, so after the surgery, now I have still have two. Ba I have uh, one bad eye, one good eye, except they switched. So everybody over here now is good. So you might not even see me wearing these glasses today. But uh, thank thanks for all the prayers. Uh, got through that. I'm I'm not a I'm I don't uh, I'm not used to surgery uh, per se and. And uh, it, was a, it was certainly an experience, but uh, God got us through it, and I'm well on the way. Uh, I have better eyesight now without my glasses uh, than I had before. And uh, so praise God. And uh, hopefully when uh, all is said and done, uh, I'll be able to see and actually read and all that good stuff. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord today, and it, it's okay. I like that, man. I'm, I'm stuck on that. I don't like that. Uh, but uh, what a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're glad to have everybody here with us and got a good crowd. Uh, and uh, a lot of folks out of town this week. We need to remember them, pray for them, and uh, pray for their needs. And uh, uh, a lot of people are out visiting, doing other things. And uh, we're, getting, we're getting back together, aren't we? Yeah. Slowly, excruciatingly, slowly. We're becoming, uh, we're beginning to get everybody back out, and I understand, we want to be safe, we want to, if you, you know, we want, want you to take care of yourself and be safe, but uh, those folks that are wearing masks, I'm just glad you're here. You. Did you see Curtis? He played the guitar with a mask on. I didn't know you could play the guitar with a mask on. I didn't. Uh, that's like the guy that went into surgery, I told the doctor the other day, I said, uh, I said, now, well, I'll, after this surgery, I surgery, will I still be able to play the piano? He said, yes. I said, well, that's great. I never could before. <laughs> so uh, that was really good. Uh, praise God. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to kind of continue in the, in the vein of where we started last week. And we're going to talk about, I hate to mention this word because it's almost a bugaboo word. You know what a bugaboo word is? You hear, it, you hear the preacher say it or your teacher say it, and you go, oh, no. Not that again. That's a bugaboo word. And, uh, but uh, I, want, I want to talk to you today about, we, we've started this series in Ephesians chapter 4 through, and, and hopefully we're going to go through chapter 6, uh, talking about the, God's church. And uh, we saw last week that God, God's church, that, we, that He's calling us to a, to a walk that is equal to the calling that He's called us to. We've been called to be the, the people of God. We've been called to be the family of God, the household of God. Uh, all those terms about what the church is. And um, so today we're going to talk about this subject. And then I'm, I'm going to say this word, this bugaboo word, and then I'm going to clarify it. We're going to talk about unity in the church. Oh, no. It's not a bugaboo word. It's not a bad thing. And we're not talking about sameness. We're not talking about everybody, everybody, uh, everybody in agreement on everything. I want to change the word unity to oneness. Because when we think about unity, we think about a whole bunch of individual people coming together and somehow unifying. That's not what church unity is about. That's not, not what Christ, Christian unity is about. It is about being one with Christ. We are one. I'm, I'm a part of the one. I'm, and I'm, a, I'm an individual. I'm special. You know, we're in living in the day where everybody has to be special. You know, 
I want my special rights and special, you know. And, th and there's nothing wrong with that. You are special to God. You are as individual as a snowflake. Okay? Oh, okay. That's fine. Would, would you turn some more of these lights on, please? Uh, just a little bit. Get a little bit more light up here. You are special. But you also, when you when you came into you came into a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work on Calvary, you became a part, a part of the body, a part of the one. And we're going to talk about being one in Christ today, and the church being one in Christ. And we're going to, we're going to cover three areas. How do we do that, man? There is, there is nothing more parabolic in in our day and time than a church that's splitting. Then the church, it's having, I, I hear it all the time. Do you hear about, oh, you, you never hear good news after this, Brother Mark. By the way, I need you to introduce your mom and dad. Would you do that right now? Yes. This is my father, Bill Hackflip, and my mother, Sarah Hackflip, and yesterday is my father's 89th birthday. Oh, great. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being with us today. Hagwoods are coming out of the woodwork, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's good. Um. But uh, I, I, I want us to understand some things about this. We're going we're gonna to get to the Word here in just a minute. Uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, as far as announcements, we've got uh, a bridal shower coming up the first Saturday. I don't know what date that is. Maybe the first or something? May the first. And uh, here at the church for Stephen and Mara. And uh, so remember that. Uh, huh? Huh? Okay. If you can meet with me up at the front, and we can get some things decided about the shower, we need to finalize a few things. So any of the ladies that's willing to help me shower, if you'll meet me up front for five minutes, we'll get it done. Okay. All right. And uh, also coming up May 3rd week, and in May will be our spring revival, and, and Reverend Keith Bowman, my brother-in-law, will be with us, and and uh, so keep praying. We'll begin to pray about that. Uh, got some things coming. We're, we're beginning to slowly, like I said, get there. And, and hopefully we'll be back there sometime June or July or whatever. But anyway, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And, uh, and uh, let's, let's welcome in, uh, welcome to the presence, our presence today, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, and we are here in his name. Uh, he said, I, I'm there. He's in the church today, so we thank him and praise him for his presence. Would you stand with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we, we have many needs in our church. We have some who are sick that you would touch and heal and help them. Uh, we have uh, concerns in other areas. Lord, you know all the needs that we have. Uh, we pray for our continued growth in our church and that we can get back to what we need to be in, in worshiping you and conducting church. and. And uh, Lord, today we pray that uh, you'd give us wisdom in the Word of God and help me, Lord. I, I need help today. I'm, uh, God, uh, with the eyesight and everything, I'm still struggling a little bit, but uh, help me, Lord, to preach your Word today to glorify you. Thank you for this place. Thank you for these people. And what a great and loving and merciful God you are and your Son, Jesus Christ. We love you, adore you, and, and we raise our glory and honor to you this day and to you. Uh, it belongs, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll begin at verse 1, uh, although we'll be dealing with 2 through 6 today. And he says in the Word of God, and I believe I'm reading from the infallible and errant Word of God, Amen. I therefore the prisoner for the Lord. This is the second time he's reminded them that he's a prisoner. And he probably wrote Ephesians uh, during his second uh, imprisonment while he was in the Mamertine prison in Rome awaiting his uh, execution. He said, I beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherein you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Uh, by virtue of that last verse, I want to talk about oneness today. I want to talk about how God takes individual believers and puts them into a 
uh, a situation and a gathering uh, uh, that is called a church. It, it, the church is God's plan. It's not my plan. I didn't come up with it. Somebody, some man down the road back many, many years didn't come up with it. God said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Uh, that word is an ecclesia. It means, uh, it means a gathering, a group. And he said, I, I'm going to build this church. And that church, uh, ha, uh, to that church uh, in the last 2,000 years, we have been God's light unto a lost and dying world. In our Sunday school lesson this morning, we learned that Israel was to be God's light to the world in the Old Testament. And of course, they, they failed in so many ways, and, and sometimes we fail. But God has got a church now. He's built a church. It, it started there in Acts chapter 2, and, and has grown and grown and grown and covered the whole earth. But how are we to act? How many of you, before you got saved, before you ever read the Bible, before you ever heard anybody preach about it, knew how to be a church member? You know, I'm thinking about these people here uh, in Acts chapter 2 and then they're hearing Jesus say in Matthew 16 about building his church. Uh, they must have went scratching their heads. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. Uh, yeah, church? What is a church? Never heard of that. Well, of course you never heard of it because it wasn't mentioned in the Old Testament. It was uh, the Old Testament writers and prophets, they saw many things, but they skipped right over the church. The church was a mystery in the Old Testament. And now here Jesus comes upon the scene. He says, we're going to have a group of people living on the earth uh, under the guise of being my church. And, and how are they going to live? What are they going to do? What are they, how are they going to act? What kind of people are they going to be? Well, he begins uh, here talking about the most important part. And anytime you say the most important part, it has to be the most important part. The most important part of being a member in the church of Jesus Christ is your attitude. Amen. You believe that? Amen. Attitude is everything. Yeah. I, I, I remember years ago when uh, I, I never did play football, although I'm a, a hunk and a physical specimen, uh, but I never did play it. I was too busy doing other things. And, uh, but uh, I remember uh, going into the locker room for PE, and they had a sign on there that said, Attitude is everything. And I, I've remembered that for years. And I have learned that to be true, that our attitude is how we think about ourselves. And so he starts out, uh, we're going, I'm going to give you three things today. First of all, I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm going to talk about, if we're going to have oneness in the church of God, we must form a mindset that reflects the true nature of who we are. That we find that in chapter, in chapter 4, verse 2. And then we also, uh, we need to realize, let me get my notes in order here. We need to be focused and make an effort, a focused effort to preserve our oneness. And then finally, we need to understand what the foundation of oneness is. Look with me, if you will, in verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another in love. Uh, of course, I love that word all. It means that, that there's absolutely no concept or idea that anything's less or lacking. So he says, I want you to understand that this must be a, this is a situation where uh, it must permeate everything. It, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll look at something and say, well, I can take that and leave that or take this and take that. No, this is something that has to be all. And God is a God of all. But he starts out by saying we need to form a, we need to have a, form a, a, a proper mindset thinking pattern about who we are in light of, uh, 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 especially of those around us. I, we need to, when we talk about oneness, we need to understand, did you know that Jesus taught more about how you treat others than anything else he taught about? Mm -hmm. That's strange, isn't it? Why didn't he, why didn't he teach and, uh, and talk about proving that there's a God? Well, he said, no, the uh, creation does that. You can look up in the stars and, and, and realize that. Why didn't he talk about this and that? He talked about a lot of things, but he talked more about how we interact with one another. Your life, your life is, is, is lived in three spheres. It is lived in a relationship between you and God. It is lived between, uh, in a relationship between you and yourself. 
In other words, these are things that you have to form opinions and thinking patterns about. And then it also has to do with how you interrelate and get along with one another. Those are the three areas. That's it. There's nothing else. So he says here, first of all, we need to form an opinion uh, based on right thinking. Uh, I, I, I was fascinated to find out in my study of this that, G, that, uh, that the, the different gospel writers and different letter writers here use the idea of being like-minded 19 times in the New Testament. Minded. Not like and hearted. Now, we all, we all have things we feel about, don't we? Uh, we all have emotions. We have feelings. That comes with the flesh. But listen, we're not talking about feelings. We're talking about thinking. What do you think about yourselves when it comes to thinking about you? What do you think about God? And what do you think about one another? He says, with all lowliness and meekness. Let's start out with lowliness. This, this word here is an interesting word. It's only found twice in the New Testament. It's also found in Romans chapter 8 when it talks about men of low estate. And what it's talking about is this. It's, it, it's, it's a strange word. They used to use it to talk about a rope being used to rein in a horse or a cow or some other kind of animal. It was the idea that the person used the rope to limit the ability of that animal or a person or whatever to get away, to do its own thing, to, to get bigger, to get out there and, and move around. In other words, if, uh, how many of you have a dog and when you walk the dog, you have to put it on a leash, okay? Uh, others have had dogs and they didn't put them on a leash and you've never seen them again. So uh, we, know, we understand that. But you put a dog on a leash or you, or you put a, a horse on a, or you have a horse bridle, you know, and uh, Sue back there rides uh, horses and stuff and Joanna and they know all about that stuff. You got to have that kind of stuff. Uh, that, limits, that limits the animal. I've been on a horse twice, it threw me off twice and I said, that's it. I'm convinced. Uh, you don't want me on your back. And I uh, never got, got on another. Uh, but uh, the idea is you've got to have it's something to control. The idea is here, he says, with lowliness. Uh, you see, the natural tendency of, of a human being with a fallen nature is to blow himself up. Toot your own horn. I wish I had a horn out here today. One of them little, you know, one of them crazy things. And, and we, we have a tendency to blow our own horn to toot our own, to want our own way, to want to propagate our agenda, to want to uh, be in the spotlight, to be the one that, that everybody looks at. That's, that's human tendency. I'm not talking about that, that all the time we do that. And, I'm, and some, are, some are worse than others. But the lowly person, the one, the one who's acting in, in, in regards to this work, is somebody who has, has limited himself. He has... He has uh, he has put a rope around his ego. He has put about a, a rope around his wants. He has put a, put a, a rope around his arrogancy and his pride. And he's saying, whoa, boy, you're thinking too much of yourself. You're getting, yeah, did your grandma ever use this phrase? You're getting too big for your britches? Huh? Yeah. And that's what she was talking about. Your, your, your ego is expanding. Your uh, idea of getting, uh, getting what you want is expanding. Your, your agenda, your self agenda is expanding. So he says, first of all, we need to limit ourselves so that we can hold ourselves down. Because if we don't, you know, don't you, and I, and I, don't name nobody because you probably name me. But you say, uh, think, about, think about dealing with a person that's all about themselves. Now, we, uh, listen, we all fail, we all falter, and, and sometimes we all have, you know, we all think about ourselves. And, and there's nothing wrong with having a good, healthy, this is not talking about an antithesis of good, healthy self-esteem. Listen, uh, God loved you so much, he sent his son Jesus to die for you. I don't know how much more self-esteem you can have than that, Amen. that he would trade his son for you. Amen. I don't think, I think he got a raw deal when he would come to me. But, you know, it's, that's him. But the idea is this, uh, if we get so big of ourselves, we're going to be a terror to live with. We're not going to get along with everybody. I, there's going to be clashes. There's going to be problems. So he says, first of all, you're not, you need to be thinking right about your own attitude about yourself. When you think about yourself, don't uh, look, look at yourself and say, oh, you know, hey, I, I got problems too. Mm -hmm. Man, with all lowliness, put a limit on how big your ego and agenda can get. 
And then he says here with meekness. Meekness is somewhat the same thing, but a lot of times people hear the word meekness and they think, oh, that means weak. We think of a meek person, you know. You know what I think about when you hear meekness? Eeyore. You know, on the, what is that? Winnie the Pooh. That little horse. He says, oh, so I'm so sad, and I'm so, I'm so bad, and I'm so dumb. And that's not meekness. That's weakness, that's self-pity. That's actually pride. Meekness is the fact that you have certain qualities, and you have certain strengths, and you are what you are, but you don't have to flaunt that to people. The meek person is somebody who says, you know, I'm willing to work with everybody. I'm willing to fit in. I'm willing to be on this level. But, uh, the Bible says that Moses was one of the meekest men that ever lived. That doesn't mean he was weak. That meant he had great strength, but he had it under control. You know, uh, strength without control is dangerous. It can hurt you. So he says, first of all, we need to be, we have a, need to have a right, form a right opinion of ourselves. Then we need to have an attitude that says, I'm willing to work with everybody. I have, I'm, I put myself under control. And then he says, with long suffering. Oh boy. How, how many times my, my parents used to say, how long are we going to have to put up with this? Huh? I said, I don't know. Uh, I, or they say, how long are you going to do this? Or how long are you going to do that? Uh, they were talking about the fact that they had gone through a process over and over and over again, and they were having to put up with it. Long-suffering. Are you long-suffering? You know, it's interesting. If you turn over in Galatians chapter 5 and uh, look at verse 22, guess what you're going to find? The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. I'm not talking about things that you produce in your own strength and your own flesh. You can't do it. These are supernatural, spiritual abilities that God gives you through the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you're not filled with the Holy Spirit and you're not under the control of the Holy Spirit and you're not led by the Holy Spirit and you're not, be, uh, you're not uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, listen, you're not going to produce these qualities like you should. That's why it's so important that's why it's so important to stay in good contact with the Holy Spirit of God, to be right with God, to obey God, to serve God. Do those things, all those things that the preacher's always harping about. Why? We don't tell you that just, because, just to, to say, well, check off this box, check off this box. No, it is the fact that when we do those things, we are right with God and God can empower us. Amen. God can empower us. Listen, we get our power from the Holy Spirit of God. He's here. He's, that's what Jesus said, uh, taught in John chapter 16 when he said, it's good for me, uh, good for you that I'm going away. Huh? He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. Why? Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come. But if I go away, I will send the Holy Spirit. And what's going to happen? He's going to fill you and help you live the life that, you're give, uh, that you've been given to, to live. He's going to fill you and you're going to be able to reach people with the gospel. You're going to be able to do what I want you to do. Amen. Listen, God doesn't, God doesn't expect us to do this by the flesh. So he says here in verse 2, we need to, be, we need to have a form of... Uh, here, here we're forming this in our minds. Okay? Uh, the, the, we, we are so today in, in, in Christianity today there's so much emphasis on feelings now feelings are important God, God made us God, we're made in the image and likeness of God God feels He loves He hates uh, he, 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 he sorrows the Bible says grieve not the Holy Spirit of God He even grieves but feelings are not the best way to form an opinion about yourself. Because here's the thing. We have a tendency to walk around with our feelings. Have you ever had a, with our feelings exposed, have you ever had a wound on your body? I know you mechanics have, Joe and others. Yeah, especially on our hands, right? And you don't even know it's there. Or maybe a paper cut. How many of you handle paper for a living? Ugh, I hate paper. I'd rather have an arm chopped off than a paper cut. <laughs> And you say, well, I didn't even know I had it. 
but all of a sudden you, your hand is exposed to some alcohol or some other kind of irritant, and boy, you know right then it's there. That's what feelings are. Feelings are open wounds sometimes that we walk around with, and this world, and especially our evil one, the enemy, Satan, has, a, has people out there who know just where to throw the salt. Yeah. Man. This past week has been wild. I, one of these days I'm going to write a book about it. But, uh, but I found out something this week. That, that the, the, this world, and, and a lot of times the people in the world, and circumstances in the world, has a way to, they, they know where you're hurt. They know where your wounds are. If you've, been, if you've been treated bad in the church, they're very ultra sensitive to things going on in the church. If you've been, if you've been, been treated bad by a person, and then this happens, folks. This happens. But we walk around with those, with those wounds and, and so easily irritated. There's, there's people sitting at home today. You sitting home watching uh, the TV maybe. There's people sitting at home today that haven't darkened the door of a church for 10, 20, 30, 40 years because one incident where somebody found their wound and threw some salt in it. Well, I'll have you know I'm not going back to that church. I'll never go back to that church. I'll never get around them people again. Why? Well, they done something to me. Sure, they've done something to you because they fall. They, they're, they're flawed. They, they have a sin nature just like you and me. We all fail. Yeah. That's why we have to be long-suffering. We, we have to look at uh, uh, our, our others like we look at ourselves. You know, you know what the best, best, uh, the best rule of life is? Jesus taught it. It's called the golden rule. You know what makes a good relationship between people? You know what makes a good church member? You know what makes a good uh, co-worker? You know what makes a good husband, a good wife? It's very simple. Live by the golden rule. You treat your spouse like you would have them treat you, and they should respond in kind. They may not, but you've done your part. You treat your church and, and, and live in a way where you treat others like you would be treated, that's the best way to live your life. Amen. That's the best way to live your life. Amen. So he goes on here and he says, let's be long-suffering. Let's put up with... Listen, I, I'm glad there's been long-suffering people in my life. Amen. Man, people have put up with me for years. My wife, bless her heart. <laughs> you know. she It's been a ride. <laughs> One thing after another. Interesting. It ain't been dull. And she's retired. Yeah. 24 hours a day. But uh, we have to be long-suffering. Why? Because that person that you need to develop a relationship with, whether they be a church member, and, and, you, and we're talking about oneness, not just unity. Listen, all doing the, listen, all, everybody doing the same thing, uh, thinking the same thing, Believing the same thing, never having a disagreement is not unity, it's conformity. Now, there are, there are some places for conformity, and he goes down in verses 5 and 6 and talks about it. There's some things that are, that are unarguably, that's a, word, it's a, it's a good word. In other words, you can't argue about it. But here we say, listen, I'm willing to put up with you. Put up with you. I hate that people have to put up with me, but they do. And then he says, be long-suffering, forbearing one another. Same thing as long-suffering in the sense that forbearing has got the idea that you endure or bear up under a burden. Now I know, I'm not, I'm not saying that we necessarily pose burdens to one another. But if you're going to be in a church or you're going to be in any other kind of organization or going to be in a husband and wife relationship, listen to me now. You've got to learn to forbear. Yeah. Now, obviously, there are certain things that we can't forbear. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about the extremes of behavior that would uh, necessitate some other kind of situation. 
But when it comes to just everyday run of the mill, living with one another, I, I love my wife. She's a wonderful person. She loves me. I'm a wonderful person. I like me. I get up every morning looking in the mirror and say, I don't like you. I don't like your looks, but I like you. Okay? But you cannot, you cannot live with somebody or be around somebody or be in a church with somebody for year after year after year and never have a situation where you don't rub one another the wrong way. You heard about rubbing, heard, heard Vance Havner talk about rubbing, rubbing things the wrong way. He, he, said, he preached a message one time and afterwards the lady came up and said, said, Preacher, I didn't like that message too good. He said, you did? He said, no, that, uh, that kind of rubbed the cat the wrong way. And he said, well, it's easy to fix. She said, hi. I said, turn him around. <laughs> turn the cat around. It won't, rub, it won't hurt near as bad. We're all going to rub one another the wrong way. We're all going to fail. Men's hearts, men's, we're flawed, sinful creatures. And at our best, the best man on this world fails. So we better get used to it. And we better learn how to deal with it. And for so many years and so, for often so many times, we have situations in the churches or in homes or in, in any kind of relationship at work where we just have to put up with people until they make progress. We want them to be making progress. Now, if you're, if you're living a life of being a constant irritant to other people, you need to get your life and heart right with God. But I'm talking about normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill wear. We need to understand that we need to forbear one another. You forgive me, I forgive you. You forgive me, I forgive you. I've heard church members, unfortunately, I've heard some in this church make this statement. I just can't forgive them. Man, do you know what you're saying? Jesus forgave you. Somebody came to Jesus one time and said, How often shall I forgive my brother? Seventy times or seven times? He said, no. Seventy times? No. He said, seventy times seven. Four hundred and ninety times. And I don't know about you, but that's a lot of times, ain't it? I don't perceive that anybody's going to uh, offend you or hurt your feelings or rub you the wrong way or irritate you 490 times in a row. Maybe they will. I don't know what you do after that 491. <laughs> Punch them in the nose, I guess. No, I don't think you do that. What he's, do what he's saying is we need to be unlimited in our forgiveness just like God is unlimited in His forgiveness. Amen. <clears throat> oh, listen. We need to have a right mind attitude about who we are and how we're going to treat others. And then he says, do it. He says, forbearing one another in love. Folks, that's the key. As we read over there just a few minutes ago, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 and 23, for the fruit of the Spirit is love. And you'll notice after that that our King James translators put a colon or a semicolon. I'm not sure what it is. I can't see that small right now. But what it means is that there is one fruit of the Spirit. He produces a fruit called love in our hearts and our lives. The Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. We are God's agents of love. We are God's distributors of His love. How is somebody going to see the love of God in this world? But that He sees it through, they see it through His people. John chapter 13 and verse 35, he said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, because you have love one for another. Not by the fact that you carry this certain kind of Bible, or you, or you voted this certain way, or, or you uh, follow this particular group. Amen. By your love. Man. How different our society would be, how different our churches would be, and how different our society would be if the premium of our behavior and the premium of what we take out to the world would make would that it would be God's love. Okay. Listen, I, you know, we're, we're here to love people. We do it in love. We do it in love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Well, you begin to understand that, don't you? That means, I, I really understand that now. Um, what it means is that when you look at somebody
through the glasses of love, uh, they don't look as bad as they used to. <laughs> Maybe those little idiosyncrasies and problems that they have don't look as bad. Maybe they're covered up. Yeah, they are covered up. Love allows me to love somebody that's unloving because I see them with God's eyes, with God's eyes of love. Folks, the church, if it is anything, if it is ever going to be anything, and I'm not, I'm not preaching this because we have a pro You know, every time you start preaching something, you have to qualify this. You have to say, oh, wow, this, we, we don't have this problem or this or that. Sometimes you have to, you have to preach uh, uh, a vaccine. I hate that's a dirty word. I shouldn't have used that. But this is a spiritual vaccine. Maybe there's a disease out there called hate. Maybe there's a disease out there called uh, revenge. Maybe there's a disease out there that says, get you back before you get me. Maybe there's a disease out there that says, I I'm going to have my own way or else. Yeah. I, I was watching an a, uh, episode of Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. I know. <laughs> it's, it's amazing when you get retired what you watch. <laughs> when you start talking to the toaster, and getting on your wife about using your favorite pot holder, it's, it's bad. But I was watching an a, 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 a episode of Dr. Quinn, and they, they got themselves together a baseball team. And they were out there choosing sides and who was going to do what, and one wanted to be a pitcher, and one wanted to be this, one wanted to be that. One guy said, I'm going to be the hurler. That was the pitcher. They said, no, you're not going to be the hurler. We're going to let this guy be the hurler. Well, it's my ball. And if I don't get to be the hurler, I'm taking my ball and going home. <laughs> oh, man, that is human nature in a nutshell. Amen. That is all about me. Focus on me. I want my way. I'm going to do whatever I have to to get my way, no matter how it affects you. Jesus said that is not the way for the church of Jesus Christ to live. Amen. We are to reflect His nature. Uh, listen, the Bible says when we get saved, we receive the, the divine, we partake of the divine nature according to 1 Peter chapter 1. Listen, if you do not have the divine nature within you, you're not of God. That's right. yeah. You might be a good, moral, decent, kind, all kinds of things person, but you are not of God if you don't have the divine nature. That's right. Amen. Yeah. That doesn't mean you're perfect. You, you're old See, we got two natures. We got the old bad Ricky and we got the good Ricky. There is a good Ricky, believe me, believe me, believe me, there is. But the old bad Ricky, he wants his way, and the old good Ricky says, No, my brother, I need to I need to love him. Sometimes you just need to to love somebody up. I like that term, love them up. You know. Someone has said that, uh, I heard one time that there are, there are about 10,000 songs written every year. 65% of them are about love. And yet we're still riding in the streets. We're still killing one another. We're still hating one another. We're still breaking up churches. We're still breaking up marriages. We're still, we're still falling apart at the seams, although we sing about love all the time. Why? Because we don't know how to love. But as the children of God, we are to set the example for a lost and dying world. The darkness of the world needs to see us and say, boy, that's, that's what love is. When people put up with one another, strive with one another, work with one another, pray with one another, cry with one another, laugh with one another, go to church with one another year after year after year, and they don't kill themselves. They love one another. Listen, it comes from, first of all, a mindset that says, I'm going to defer to my brother. He uses, the, he uses the frame, he uses the phrase in Philippians 2, esteeming others better than yourselves. 
It's called putting that other person forward. You ever done that? You ever gone out to Walmart and be standing in line to check out and you got something? I was out there one day and there was a lady standing there and she had one little one in her arms and one in the uh, riding in the in the buggy there and they were both screaming. And uh, and I was screaming by the way too. So uh, but uh, I said, ma'am, why don't you go ahead of me? And she just she just looked shocked. And I think the world has lost the idea of deferring to people. I don't weaken myself. I don't show myself weak. I don't show myself uh, uh, unworthy of something. That was my place in line. I was worthy of it as anybody. But I saw her situation. I deferred to her. I esteemed her greater than myself. He said, preferring one another in love. Give that place to them. Give that situation to them. Give in to them. We're to love one another. If we love one another, listen, you cannot, and I close with this. We cannot, you cannot separate a right relationship with God from a right relationship with your brother. You read 1 John chapter 4. He said, Hereby we perceive the love of God that we love one another. He that hateth his brother abideth in death. The one who says, I've seen God or love God has not seen God if he doesn't love his brother. Five or six times in, in 1 John chapter 4, he mentions that the connection of loving God and loving one another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've, I've almost heard people in the same breath say, I love God, and then turn around and talk about a brother. Yeah. I had a brother come up to me several years ago, and I was happened to be at my workplace, and I didn't really have time for it. And... Uh, he started talking about some people in my church. And I guess he was used to getting by with that, but I'll guarantee you he didn't get by with it that day. I stopped him dead in his tracks in front of God and the whole world. He said, didn't that embarrass you? Uh, it embarrassed him a whole lot more. And I said, them's my church people. I love them. I know they're not perfect, but you ain't going to stand there and talk about them. The, 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 the Bible does not cater to the idea that you can love God on one hand and not get along with your brother. That's right. The Bible says you can't pray to God and get your presence unless you first go to a brother and get forgiveness if there's a situation between. We think we can do just anything we want to the brethren, to people around us, and it doesn't affect our relationship with God. Oh, it does. God knows all about it. I've tried. I know know how impossible it is. I'm not saying it's hard. It's impossible to have a right relationship with God and be at odds with a brother and sister in Christ. I've gone to brothers. I don't think I've ever had a problem being wrong with a sister. I usually just went ahead and told them, yes, you're right, and that took care of it. But I've had to go to a brother before and say, brother, and, and, and it's not a question of them being right. It's not a question of me being right. It's not a question of us agreeing on a situation. Many times, there was, not a, there was not a reconciliation of our minds about a certain thing, but there was a reconciliation in my mind about how I treated them. Mm-hmm. I had to go to God in prayer. I had to get that cleaned up. That was an outstanding situation that God said, no, you can't, you can't go around that. You can't ignore that. You can't, uh, I, 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 that's got to be fixed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's got to be fixed. Yeah. 
God's church is supposed to be special and it starts with our attitude about how we treat one another. Do you know one of the things you're going to answer for when you stand before God? Oh, you're going to answer for your sin. If, you're under the, if your sin's under the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ is efficient for washing sins of man and women away. No sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But you will stand before God and we will, we will have an opportunity to win a crown and give an account of how we've treated others. That's so important. You see, what did, what did, when that young man came to Jesus and said, well, hey, I, I, what's the law? What's the big deal? What's the, what's the most important thing? That young man said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy strength and all thy soul and all thy might. And you should love your brother as yourself. The most important thing in your life is to love God. But the second most important thing in your life is to love your brother and sister, especially love your brother and sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. God takes account of that. Yes. I wish I could snap my fingers. If I could snap my fingers and get whatever I wanted after I got a cheeseburger... I can't have cheeseburgers like I used to. That's sad. Uh, no, if I could snap my fingers, I'd say, well, heal all the sicknesses. That would be, that would be pretty special, wouldn't it? Uh, stop all the crime, yes. That'd be, have all the money, I guess, in some way. But if I could snap my fingers and heal every broken relationship in this world. People would lay their guns down. Mm -hmm. They'd lay their swords down. They'd take their fingers off the buttons. Mm -hmm. Wives, husbands would reconcile and love one another again. Moms and dads would hear from long lost sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. Friends, that parted in a, in a situation of, of anger and rage even, would pick up the phone and say, I'm sorry, I love you. Oh, what a difference that would make in this world. What a difference it would make in the eyes, in, the, in, the, in, in front of God, when he's seen us. What did he say? Blessed are the peacemakers. Mm -hmm. Because why? We shall be called the children of God. Amen. Nothing greater than being a peacemaker. Amen. The devil wants you to sow seeds of discord. My final thought on this is this. For the church to be the church of Jesus Christ, if we want to keep and maintain the unity that God has created at Calvary, all selfishness, ego, arrogance, envy, personal agenda, attacks, gossip, backbiting, hatred, bias, must cease immediately. That's the mandate to God's church in this world. Right now, our society is coming apart at the seams. If this society is ever going to see true love and true uh, acceptance and true forgiveness and true uh, uh, treating one another rightly, it should be in God's special people the household of God, the church of God. Amen. 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 Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Lord, as we go into a time of you speaking to our hearts, this is just simply an opportunity for God's people to respond in a way that you've told them to. 
Lord, speak to us as our hymnist and our pianist plays the hymn of invitation. During this invitation, let us ponder where we are spiritually, who we are spiritually, and what God needs to do in our lives today. Would you stand with me, heads bowed and eyes closed? Maybe you're unsaved and unsure of your salvation. Today's the day. You must be born again. It's not a, it's not a question of... It's an option. It's, it's imperative. It's essential. You must be born again. The blood of Jesus Christ must be applied to your sins to wash away your sins, to cover you, to forgive you, to make you a child of God. And you do that by believing in Him, repenting of your sin, accepting Him as Lord and Savior. Maybe you're, and, and you're a Christian, but God has spoken to your heart about your attitude. You will never be bigger or smaller, greater or lesser than your attitude. How you think about yourselves, how you think about others, affects how you think about God. If you see yourself as a victim and everybody else is your antagonist, you will go out of here with an attitude and say, man, I don't know, I just can't get along with this world. Yes, people have hurt you. And there may even still be an open wound, but you really need to let that wound heal. It's only hurting you. And the devil, he sees it and he says, I'm going to throw some salt in that wound. Every chance I get, I'm going to make that person feel terrible and hurt all over again. True forgiveness brings true liberty. Have you been mistreated? Forgive them. Long bear, long suffering, put up with them until Jesus does something in their heart and life. That's what Jesus did for you. He put up with you. He forgave you over and over and over and over again. Uh, my desire is that we walk out of this place today free. Free of pain and hurt that we have for others. I, I call them IOUs. You hurt me, so I'm going to keep this IOU in my pocket. And every time, I, I'm going to be reminded of that IOU. I owe you something, buddy. I'm going to get you. That ain't the way God's people ought to live. God's people ought to reach in that pocket and fling them IOUs to kingdom come and say, Praise God, free at last, free at last. Okay. Thank you for being here today. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. You made a good decision today uh, to be being it to God. And we know folks are out there still waiting and we want to pray for them and pray for those that are traveling today. Remember those that are sick. Uh, nothing is going to happen of eternal consequence outside of our prayer life. Please pray for this church. Pray for your pastor. You say, boy, I wish you were a better pastor. Pray for me. I wish you was a better preacher. Pray for me. The more you pray, the, the man, the better I'll preach, I'll guarantee you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, all hearts and minds clear? Okay, let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. Mr. Mr. Bill Hagwood, good to have you with us today. Your lovely wife, and 89 years, man. You're still kicking, praise God. And... Uh, Appreciate having y'all with visiting with us today. Let's be dismissed now with a word of prayer. Brother Roger, would you dismiss us? Father, we come to you today to worship. We come here because we believe your word. We believe that your son died for us. He was tortured and bled on the cross. He bled all his blood, all his
through the blood for us. And that's why we're here today, to thank you, to worship you, to let you know that we believe. And Lord, we fully expect to live with you because you said we could. We thank you, Lord, today for the church body. Thank you for our brothers and sisters. Thank you for blessing us like you do. Thank you for our pastor. Lord, we just thank you for everything. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for your son. His precious name. Amen. 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 Ladies, just five minutes. Just five minutes, I promise.